Uh, thank you very much, dear Wendy, for that introduction. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Reflect 2020. It's a pleasure to be given the opportunity to speak to you today. I kind of get awkward when the video is on at the same time as my presentation. So I'll just turn off the video just so that I can focus on my presentation, but you would be able to hear my voice, hopefully. Um, so yeah, um, I'm just going to go straight into it. So over the next 10 minutes, I will speak to you about my journey, uh, as I've been asked to speak to you today about challenges and opportunities that have come about in my career, and just general tips and advice to encourage you in your own path and journey. And I'll take any questions during the panel session at the end. Uh, so I'll just go straight into it. So I decided to use pictures and not use text for the journey, and just because I don't want people uh, falling asleep. So this is me. I titled this slide the come up. I don't know why, but I'm still going up, so it's very appropriate. I was born and raised in Nigeria, um, and I did my pro all my um, formal education before um, university back home in Nigeria. Um, I put my position. So in Nigeria, we do have rankings um, from very early age. Not everybody's a winner. We're, we're told very, very early on. I started primary school when I was two, and I, was, I used to come 27th in the class of 28th. And it used to really bother my parents because my siblings were coming first in their class. But I was so satisfied with the knowledge that at least I passed one person in the year. And so that was good enough for me to keep going, to be honest. And because I used to say, what, what would the last person's parents say? He didn't pass anybody. But I was like, why are you focused on the one person behind you and not the 26 above you? But that said, I got support throughout my years. I always thought school was a place for fun make friends, I played football, so that's me in front there. It was a friend's birthday and I'm quite eager to eat that cake as you can see. And um, yeah, I did my primary and secondary education as well. In Nigeria, we don't have A-levels, so straight after your um, high school, you go straight to university. And um, so normally you go at 16, but our courses are five years and not three years like the UK, so you would make up the time in the end. Um, but very early on, my parents knew I wasn't gonna study at university in Nigeria because we have frequent strikes in the academic year and that could delay like when you finish your course. So I was going to go to study in Ghana and um, but my parents didn't want me sitting at home for a year not doing anything and Nigerians don't praise Ghana, Ghanaians very um, often. It's just a banter we have but on this occasion I give it to them. They have a good educational system in Ghana and so I was going to go to study in Kumasi and um, but again, my parents didn't want me staying at home for one year, not doing anything. So they sent me to an A-level school. While I was there, the kids were um, applying to go to the US and go to um, America. And I just got caught the bug and just went along with it and applied through UCAS and I got offers for five universities. Unfortunately, I didn't make my predicted grades, which were A, A, B. Um, and so I got rejected by my firm choice, but my insurance hadn't um, changed, which was Loughborough University. Now I say, I did accelerated A-levels, which is your AS and A2 in one year. I don't recommend you do it. In fact, the people who created A-levels don't recommend you do it. But then having said that, my friends got A-stars and A's, and I don't know what, what they do in their houses, but yeah, that was very incredible. And so I got three C's, and, but I was asked to downgrade from the MNG program, which is the master's program, to the BNG program. And then there are opportunities during the academic year, if I get a good grade, to go back onto the BNG program. Uh, uh, we'll go back onto the MNG program. So this level here just talks about my motivations really. So I come from Nigeria, like I said before, we're one of the largest oil and gas producers in um, Africa. And um, so I come from Cross River State, which is here. So this region is called the Niger Delta and it's very oil rich, is where all the oil comes from. But Cross River, a great a part of our economy comes from tourism. So we make money through tourism by people coming to visit. So very early on in schools, you're taught about preserving and conserving your um, environment, your natural um, rainforest that you have there. Um, but also, um, I was aware of how oil exploration had caused significant struggles in various communities um, because it wasn't done sustainably. And that coupled with my reality of um, low accessibility to electricity. So I um, went through the stages when I was young. I had to use uh, candles to do my homework. Um, it's, it's just a typical stage. So as my parents' income improved, my access to electricity also improved. So from there, we went to kerosene lanterns and then rechargeable lamps that my parents would take to their office and charge. 
and bring them back home at night for us to do our work with. And the ultimate goal was always to work towards having your own diesel generator, which is not sustainable in itself. And um, so that was my motivation. I thought by studying electronic and electrical engineering, I could become an electronic and electrical engineer and perhaps work towards improving those um, infrastructure at the national grid, et cetera, in my own country. So I came to Loughborough when I was 17. That was my first time in the UK, far away from home, didn't know anybody. Um, it was really daunting, um, but I was also excited to be able to, I felt very privileged to be able to get that opportunity to go to that top university. But it also made me feel like I had to catch up because I knew I came in with poor grades in comparison to my peers. And so I did spend quite a lot of the first year really in the library, just getting, brushing up and trying to catch up with the rest. And it kind of helped that I was 17. I wasn't allowed in any clubs. So freshers was a no, no go. I was bounced from everywhere I went. <laughs> and once you show your ID, so that kind of helped. And I was able with the support um, from my personal tutors and just even my peers, when I made friends eventually and people in the year above me, I made friends with those because they've been through that journey before. It's nice to be able to get their perspective on things. And I graduated with a first class and I was offered a scholarship by Loughborough University to do my PhD. Now, I started my PhD, the funding was for three years. It was in wind energy and advanced signal processing. We won't go into much too much detail because of time and I could take questions afterwards. I started my PhD when I was 20 um, and that's not very typical. So a lot of times it, it, was, it was challenging. I was, it's still one of the hardest things I think I've done in my lifetime. And even though it's really short. Um, Something I didn't say during my undergraduate was about internships. I didn't get any placements and I didn't go for any placements. And that's something, if you're in university at the moment, I would strongly recommend you try and get placements and I'll explain why. So now doing a PhD, three year funding, towards the end of my funding, I hadn't finished my thesis. So I started looking for jobs because otherwise I would have to pay for the remaining years of university. And it was really difficult to find a job. So there are layers to it. So for me, I needed a visa as an international student. You need visa sponsorship to take up employment in the UK. And not many energy companies were willing to sponsor visas at the, at the time because they're not very cheap, they're very expensive. And I now had this additional layer where I've completed this number of years in education with no internship experience, not even like a summer or a, a, a work placement or work experience whatsoever. So that kind of compounded my um, um, should I say challenges applied for 100 jobs, I kid you not, I kept an Excel spreadsheet just so that I don't apply to the same company twice. Um, and I just kept getting rejected. So I had to refocus. So energy sector, the generation side and the transmission side, I'm not getting any luck. Where else do you need electricity? And I started to look in the construction sector on the consumption side. So looking at the consumption side now, and the construction industry also is still lacking a lot of skills. So not many UK or EU nationals apply to jobs there. So it's a skill shortage problem that they have. And so I started applying to the construction industry and my first role, I, got, I was successful. I got a, pla a place as a graduate engineer at Condo and working as a, a graduate building services engineer. So designing electrical services for buildings. So it wasn't the generation end, but I could still apply the learnings or the general knowledge from electronic and electrical engineering, which I had done in my course. Obviously it was challenging because I hadn't finished my PhD by then. So I used to do my PhD from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. just before work starts. And there were two different disciplines, what my PhD was in and what I was actually working on. And then I'll do company work from 9 to 5 p.m. and then clock out and continue with my PhD from 5 to midnight, then go home repeat the cycle until I finished my thesis in 2015 and I graduated in 2016. Um, I tell that story because um, um, it shows hard work. It's something I wanted for myself, so I had to put in the time, but I also knew that it's not gonna be that way forever. Once I had put in the time and finished that PhD, I could crack on with whatever else that was out there for me. And um, I got promoted, luckily, to, electrical and, uh, to a full electrical engineer. And in 2019, I decided that I wanted to go back into research. And so I joined BRE, which is the Building Research Establishment, um, and to, to do more research in, um, around how we use sensors. So instead of using sensors in wind turbines now, which I did for my PhD, how we use sensors in buildings. But during this period, I was able to work on a lot of international projects. I got to travel, um, which was really exciting. And that's something very global about engineering. It is needed everywhere in the world. So even if your local community doesn't appreciate your talent in that sector, you could always explore opportunities elsewhere. And it's the same thing, it's universal. 
Um, so what do I do now in smart buildings? In smart buildings, I do a lot of research as part of BRE. So BRE is the world's leading building science center. And the key function is generating and disseminating knowledge through training, publications, and advice that enable construction professionals and industry to work better and smarter. So in that remit, there are various elements to look at this fire, safety um, of the materials, but I focus on sensors and how we use IoT, Internet of Things sensors within buildings, whether it's to measure the environment and how people feel within it, but also the performance of those sensors. And what are they measuring? Are they measuring accurately, whether it's air quality, how accurately are they measuring it? Who gets visibility of that information when it is measured and when it is collected? How do we protect people's information? How do we protect people's data? So cyber security. But how could we also use those information and data in a digital environment where we're building a digital twin of the physical? So these, these are being models of our estate. We have a lot of test buildings where we kit them out with various technology and measure. But there's also work around the visualization of that information when you measure it. So whether it's virtual reality, augmented reality, um, and how can we distribute that knowledge to industry to inform the courses that people are doing in university? And I've been fortunate in my career to be um, put forward for various awards by my employers. Year one, they touched on some of them. I wouldn't go into detail. But I did put myself forward for the IIT Young Woman Engineer of the Year Award in 2017, which I won. And it's one of the most, it's one of the things I'm proudest about um, in my career so far. Um, so now to kind of conclude, and I think at this point, I'm quite happy to put on my video back. And to quite conclude, I just put some high level takeaway and we could talk about this more in the questions period. And engineering is global and diverse. And it underpins our um, collective success and making a positive difference, at least in my case. So I came here as a 17 year old. And in that time with the skills I've learned from my course and from working in industry, I've been able to go back um, and do some projects as well. So last year I went with a team of 25 women, we went to Malawi, we built a new STEM um, center there. And I hope to do more of those sustainable and positive influence types of projects, but also in my actual role, in my work I do at Smart Buildings. I wrote to work smart and um, in the very beginning, I always thought working hard was it, but working smarter is a, is a new level unlocked. Working smarter is being aware of your strengths and your weaknesses and also ensuring that you control your time rather than letting time control you. So don't let anybody else's timetable, anybody else's schedule to dictate your own life plan, if that makes any sense. But also be, being aware of your strengths and weaknesses, you could dedicate more time to focusing on your weaknesses and building on those, finding resources for that. The next one is Google it, which just falls into that. So for me, everything, things I don't understand, there are many things I don't know, even though it may seem like I'm an expert in things, Google is my best friend and I recommend it, whether it's for technical stuff or even life skills. So like things like emotional intelligence, which you need in the workplace, social intelligence. I Google a lot of resources about that. I had a plan, but high level. So I had a plan and it has gone like way beyond everything else I had envisioned for myself. My plan was just to do well in my degree so that I don't block the chances for my sisters coming because my dad said, if you fail, none of your sisters are coming. So that was my goal at the beginning. And then with help from like um, mentors and my personal tutor, I started putting on things like I wanted to become chartered because he was, and he told me about that. So I just put the various routes here. Chartership is not just the only one. There are other steps as well you can look for. Um, and as you know already, I, I assume, I, I, I've been told most people on the call are 18 and above. So you have already made that decision that this is kind of the space you want to occupy. But being aware of what's out there, network, LinkedIn is very great for that. Get a mentor. Many people are willing to offer support. I am. Feel free to get in touch with me on LinkedIn or on Twitter. Um, also, um, seek opportunities, especially in this pandemic. I think the pandemic has been negative in many ways, but it also has some positives. A lot of sessions are very accessible because it's all on the web now. Before, you'd have to travel to London physically to attend some of these. So it's nice that everybody everywhere in the world can access this. So utilize it as well and seek opportunities. There are virtual internships going on now. As I had mentioned, year one day hosted one for the past couple of weeks, but I've seen a few other ones on LinkedIn. So get plugged in, take opportunities and, and just do it. Don't overthink it. Something I always did was overthink it. And then give opportunities because it's a good way to get new skills and unlock a new level. 
So I put some organizations here that I volunteered with. Uh, I started volunteering because I was shy. I'm not going to act like I was some Mother Teresa. I just wanted to help the world. No, I was very shy. But as part of my PhD, you're supposed to present at conferences about your work. And my tutor recognized that very early. And so encouraged me to become a STEM ambassador. So I started presenting my work to kids. And they were a brilliant audience because they would ask so many questions and some things I hadn't even thought of because I was so focused on the high level detail. Um, and they just ask you basic questions that you can't answer that. So that improved my confidence. And by giving, or should I say, giving opportunities to other people through my volunteering, I've actually developed a lot more skills for my own self, which I use in my career. But also have fun with it. Um, I'm always worried about doing these presentations, especially when my, like, I talk about my age and stuff because some people may be put off by it, but I'm hoping that it encourages you rather than puts you off of it. Everybody's time skill is different. Everybody's journey is different. But I think having the right tools and having the right information could actually help shape that. So I put some links here because often people talk about funding. It's a challenge. And maybe you could take a screenshot of that. I'm happy to share after. But these are organizations that offer bursaries, scholarships, whether it's for any project you want to do. So I traveled to Malawi. I got a travel grant from the IET. The IET do sponsorships for both undergraduate and apprentice, so you don't have to go through university to access some of these bursaries. But then approach companies as well. Universities also have some funds available, but I also employ, encourage, encourage you to approach other organizations. But then also use social media. So these are some of the YouTube channels I follow. I really love them because it's a quick way. I'm a visual learner. So being able to see videos, being able to see clips about engineering concepts, or even just about IOTs when I first started off working in this, I find them very useful. If you're into built environment, I recommend the B1M, and I, I find it really interesting. So yeah, I'm happy to take any questions later on, and feel free to get in touch on social media, and I will pass it back to Yewande now. So thank you.